Um, okay, so the, the LVAD, this is an introduction to LVADs or left ventricular assist device. Um, like I said, my name is Monica Thomas. I am the LVAD coordinator here at WVU Medicine. This is a two-part uh, lecture just due to the how much uh, content I had. Um, I'm going to try to get through maybe the first 18 slides today and then resume on May 17th with the second part. But just to start, um, if you want to go ahead and go next, to start with this um, introduction. I do like to start about a little bit about, you know, the challenges in advanced heart failure and kind of talk about the definitions of what, you know, what is advanced heart failure. So you can go next, Caitlin. So implications in heart failure in the U.S., and this is uh, relatively new data. It was updated in 2016 that there are 5.7 million um, adults in the U.S. that have heart failure, and up to 1.5 million are in the advanced stages. So at least 25, and there's at least 25,000 of those patients that are appropriate candidates for advanced therapies. There's an estimated 3,200 donor, donor hearts available for heart transplant, and there's, so that makes us, there's a supply of donor hearts is limited, and then transplant is not also, is not an option for all patients. 2,000, or 270,000 patients die of heart failure each year, and about half of the people with heart failure die within five years of diagnosis. So we go next. Heart failure is the leading cause of death after cancer. In class four, heart failure mortality at one year is similar to that of aggressive malignancies. So you see the one-year mortality, lung cancers at 70% one-year mortality, pancreatic at 79, and class four heart failure with optimum medical management is 75%. Uh, next. So with heart transplant is considered the gold standard for treatment of advanced heart failure, but there is a a limited supply of donor hearts. So with 25,000 patients that need, or that are appropriate candidates for advanced therapies, there's only 3,000, estimated 3,200 heart transplants per year. So that leaves a lot of candidates without, or a lot of patients without an option. So next. And you can see here how the prevalence of heart failure continues to grow, um, but the number of heart transplants has not kept up pace. We've had a little bit incline. It used 2,500 was kind of where we stood, and then we've jumped up a little bit to about 3,200. So next, we'll go ahead and just kind of talk about a, just the basic understanding of what is heart failure. So due to numerous conditions, the heart does become weak. It becomes stretched. It's unable to pump oxygenated blood effectively to the body. Heart failure can occur left ventricular, right ventricular, or biventricular failure. With left heart failure being the most common form of heart failure, um, that's good considering we are talking about left ventricular assist device and knowing that LVADs or left ventricular assist device are the only FDA approved durable implantable heart pumps um, that are on the market right now. There are 5.7 million people in the US and 600 new cases a year. And heart failure costs about $30.7 billion annually. And then 50% of these patients do die within five, five years of diagnosis. Um, with the heart failure, we do stage patients with the NYHA, NYHA scale. We do class one, um, we do stage one class A for mild, stage four class D end stage. Um, a lot of the patients that the patients that I deal with are stage four class D um, when I see them for advanced therapies. Can you go next, Caitlin? So causes and types of heart or causes and types of heart failure. So cardiomyopathy or changes of the muscle or structure of the heart. So we have our ischemics or non-ischemics. We do like to know um, kind of the etiology of the heart failure. That's kind of it's kind of important to us. It and, you know helps us with these patients a little bit. So with your ischemics, of course, you see your coronary artery disease, the heart attacks, the cabbages, and then we see the see we see a significant amount of the non-ischemics, the virals, familials, drugs, toxins, idiopathic, and valvular. Um, my patients, the patients that we have implanted here at WVU, they've kind of, I think I've only had, of the seven patients we've implanted since the start of our program, I think I've only had two ischemic cardiomyopathies. The rest have been non-ischemic. Um, I've had a familial, I've had a, a, a toxin patient with chemotherapy. Um, I don't believe I've had seen an idiopathic yet, but so we do see a wide range of that. Go ahead and go next, Caitlin. So let's talk a little bit about what is what is an LVAD or left ventricular assist device. So an LVAD is an implantable, um, durable mechanical device that helps pump blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. And it's used in patients who have weakened hearts or heart failure. It doesn't replace the native heart or native heart remains intact. 
we'll hear terms like LVAD, VAD, or heart pump. As you can see in the picture on the slide there, that's actually a picture of the HeartMate 2 LVAD. It is, there is an, um, an inflow cannula that attaches to the apex of the left ventricle, and the pump sits there right under the, um, right in the intrathoracic cavity, and then you see an outflow cannula that ties into the ascending aorta. So this pump's a lot smaller, it's the newest pump on the market, a lot smaller than the HeartMate 2 pump. Um, some surgeons are implanting these using a um, thoracotomy style approach. You can see a line that comes from the pump itself that comes down to exit the abdomen, as you see on the mannequin. It will exit the abdomen on the right or left. Depends on the anatomy of the patient, surgeon preference, right or left handedness of the patient. And then that drive line is connected to what you see there as a system controller. Um, that's kind of what supplies the power to the pump itself. So that drive line should always have to be connected um, from the pump into the patient. And then there's a white power lead and a, a black power cable that are the power source. So in that mannequin there, those power sources are hooked up to batteries. They are 14 volt lithium ion batteries. That external equipment weighs somewhere between five and seven pounds. So it does become quite cumbersome for the patients to carry around every day. They do have a, a choice, we'll get into equipment a little bit later, but they do have a choice to plug into a you know, wall power in the evening. So you can go next, Caitlin. So uh, LVAD, implants have been increasing since 2009 due to the limitations in available donor hearts, which we talked about earlier. I mean, transplants do offer hope for about 2,500 or 3,000 advanced heart failure patients each year. That still leaves 250,000 patients with no viable treatment option. So it is the treatment of choice for NYHA class 3B or class 4 heart failure patients and patients that aren't a transplant candidate. This last bullet point is truly why I do my job. Um, it does increase survival it decreases heart failure emissions, and it improves patients' quality of life. Next. Um, so indications for use. So what we see these patients is, you can see this happen in an emergent situation. Patients come in in cardiogenic shock. That's not ideally what we like to do, and it's not something that we do typically do here at WVU Medicine. We do have a lot of temporary support devices that when these patients come in in cardiogenic shock that we can put them on, you know, ECMO, impellas, balloon pumps, different kind of IV medications to help them get through that, you know, cardiogenic shock phase. And then in terms of um, this bridge to transplant or destination therapy, this is something the FDA has asked us and to label our patients and the Joint Commission likes us to label these patients, whether they're a bridge to transplant or a destination therapy. So a bridge to transplant patient will be a patient that we implant an LVAD on that is a transplant candidate. They have non-reversible left-sided heart failure. They don't have any contraindication to transplant and we actively have them listed on a transplant list. So these patients don't smoke, their BMI is less than 35, you know, they don't do drugs, they don't have other end organ failure. Destination therapy are patients that we implant, and all the patients we've implanted at WVU Medicine were implanted for destination therapy, are patients that are getting an LVAD, that are in-stage heart failure, that aren't a candidate for heart transplant. They smoke or use tobacco products. Um, the BMI is greater than 35. Some centers will let a BMI be greater than 40. Um, age, 70, age greater than 70, that's relative. We do, have, we do implant patients that are older than 70. Um, and they do transplant patients, excuse me, transplant patients that are older than 70, but it, it's, it's relative. As patients start to hit the 70 years old and older, you start to deal with a lot of other comorbidities to make them not a transplant candidate. And one thing with destination therapy and, and batting these patients um, for destination therapy, realize that it is a form of palliative care. The average life of a, a heart pump of an um, of an LVAD is three to five years. There are patients that have been on support greater than 10 years, but these patients average life is three to five. So typically when the physicians ask me to walk into the room to talk to the patient to discuss, you know, what is an LVAD and do education, by that point the patient really has somewhere between six months, six to 18 months to live is what they're thinking their prognosis is. And then I walk in and say, okay, you, you know, if you're a candidate for this therapy, you could get, you know, on average three to five years. The reason that number is three to five is um, one, patients get transplanted, so they do go to transplant. Um, two, the patients, act, they die. I mean, it happens, they die from complications of the LVAD, they die for other reasons. Um, number three, they had to have their pump replaced. The pump malfunctioned, it clotted, for whatever reason the pump had to be replaced, so the pump had to um, be exchanged. And then number four, 
is, and I tell this to patients and not to offer false hope at all, but number four, a very, very small percent of these patients, less than 5%, fully recover. So they fully recover and the pump is actually explanted and they were actually, you know, their, their heart function recovered. So that's kind of like, you know, a lot of times we start optimizing medical management on these patients after LVAD implant because of that small percent of, of recovery. One thing to know, too, with this bridge to transplant and destination therapy, these patients can jump back and forth status. So they can be vatted with the intention that they are destination therapy, and they can be quit smoking and be tobacco-free for six months, and they can go, go through a transplant workup and potentially be a transplant candidate. I actually have a patient that that happened to. He was a tobacco, um, was a tobacco user. He rubbed snuff, and... Um, he has been tobacco free since his VAD implant back in August. And I think probably about two months ago, we talked to a transplant center and he got listed as status four on the heart transplant list. He has not received his heart yet. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, he has a typo. So it will probably take him. They thought about 18 months to two years before he could get a heart at the earliest. Um, but knowing that if he would start, you know, using tobacco again, or he'd have a disabling stroke or some other end organ damage, he could go from that bridge to transplant status back to destination therapy. So know that they can, those are interchangeable and can, they can jump back and forth. So always make sure, you know, when we're talking to these patients and doing education, the big thing is making sure they know that even though, you know, your goal is to get to transplant, there's things that can happen and complications that could prevent that. Go next. So the equipment and the parameters, so we looked at um, this picture right here is actually a HeartMate 2. So the first picture on the mannequin that I showed you was the HeartMate 3. You saw how it was more, um, that had that apex, it was right in the apex. There wasn't um, an in the intrathoracic, fully in the intrathoracic cavity, where the HeartMate 2 is a little bit larger pump. It's a coaxial pump that has to be put into the intra-abdominal cavity, and they have to actually build a pump pocket for it. For that, P, for that pump. It still ties in, the inflow cannula still goes into the apex of the left ventricle and the outflow graft still ties into the ascending aorta. You'll note that there's still the drive line that would exit one side of the abdomen or the other and connect to that system controller that you see there. And the batteries, the 14 volt lithium ion batteries are still there. So that five to seven pounds of external equipment. So one thing to know with all these devices that we do have on market, we have the HeartMate 2, HeartMate 3 from Abbott and then, um, HVAD from Medtronic, they all have type of controller that's kind of either the brains of the outfit that kind of runs the computer with the HeartMate 3. It actually just serves as a power source. So knowing that that always has to be connected. They get batteries for daytime that come with the clips to to plug their equipment into. And then for nighttime, we give them a power source at home. So there's like a, um, they have a, a mobile power unit that they have at their house that they plug in and they can hook up to power at night and charge their batteries. We do send them home with a battery charger. And then every patient, um, whenever they present anywhere and if they show up in, in different clinics or different offices, I keep I try to keep them very well educated to talk to patients that, or talk to providers that have never seen an LVAD. I always make sure that they have a backup equipment. I always make them carry backup batteries with them, two backup batteries and a backup controller. In the event that they're out and about and their batteries start to die because they got stuck in traffic, there was an accident, the road was shut down, there was a storm that they have those backup batteries in the event um, of, you know, running behind time or the batteries dying. Also, I make them carry a backup controller. So every patient gets the controller that they're hooked up to that runs their pump and then a backup controller that they keep in a bag with them. And that's in the event that the controller would malfunction. Um, we teach them how to do a controller exchange. If it's not an emergent thing for a controller exchange. I will bring them in the hospital, but some of my patients live three hours away. And if it's something urgent or something that needs done that I can't get them into the hospital, then I've, I've trained them on how to do a controller exchange um, in the event that they would need to do that. Um, and then there's parameters. So these parameters are kind of, um, kind of let us know how the pump runs and, and what numbers we get from this from these LVADs. So basically, the first thing is speed. So speed is runs in uh, revolutions per minute or RPMs, and it's something we set. The speed is set in the OR when the patient's implanted and can be adjusted while the patient's in the hospital in the post-operative period while they come to clinic or throughout the um, throughout a hospital stay. That can be changed. We have a, a system monitor that we keep in the hospital where we can interrogate the LVAD and change their speed. Once the patient goes home, they have no way to change the speed. Um, power is also a direct number that tells us in watts how much power it takes to run their LVAD at that set speed. 
The next two numbers are estimated. They're um, derived from a calculation or an algorithm. Um, there are no flow is another number that it gives us. It's can, these patients can get full support of 2.5 up to 10 liters per minute of flow. There is no flow probe inside these devices. So the flow that we are getting is an estimated value. Um, the flow, the estimation of the flow in the HeartMate 3 is more accurate because we do use the hematocrit to, they use the hematocrit in that calculation to develop the flow. And the pump is, does have some um, alarm set in place that if the flow drops, if it senses the flow to be below 2.5 liters per minute, or it's not good wash, blood washing of the pump itself, it will alarm to let you know that there's something going on with the patient, something going on with the pump that's causing this low flow or you know, not good blood washing of the pump. Because if you have a low flow or not good blood washing, one, the patient's not getting the full support of the pump, and two, you know, blood's kind of sitting there that could be caused for stagnant blood or, you know, uh, clots in the pump. And then the, the last value there, PI or pulsatility index, this is only uh, for the HeartMate 2 and HeartMate 3 patients. It is, it, it's definitely a derived number that's made on a calculation and it, it's derived to kind of kind of let the, the clinician know what's going on in terms of the ventricle. How well are we unloading the left ventricle? Um, how much pulsatility is in the left ventricle? Is the pump doing the work? Is the ventricle doing the work? So it kind of gives us an idea along with the clinical picture. We don't just use PI as one number to determine these, but PI with the clinical picture can tell us, you know, give us an idea if the, the ventricle needs unloaded a little bit more, if the ventricle's pulsatile. So, you know, we need to increase the speed to let the ventricle rest. rest. Um, so it does give us a little bit of an idea. It also, with that, with that calculation of PI, what one thing that's nice is it does have a parameter in place that if it senses, you know, a change in intrathoracic pressure, and it's again a calculation, um, it it will drop to a low speed limit um, to prevent the ventricle from sucking down on itself because we do have a set speed. The the speed is set, um, and the pump just runs at a set speed. So we do have, there are alarms in place and there's things in place with the pump itself to kind of help us in the event that the patient, you know, we're unloading the ventricle too much or, you know, the patient's volume status has changed. Um, just one thing to know that at any given speed, an increase in blood pressure will de decrease flow. And we'll talk, we'll go more into patient management and the effects of, you know, arrhythmia management, blood pressure management, and different things on these LVAD patients. You go next, uh, Caitlin. So here's the system controller of a HeartMate 3, and it does have these alarm indicators in place. So if there's something going on with the pump, you, it will alarm the patient. One nice thing is it's very user-friendly. I send patients home that have no medical background whatsoever. I teach them, you know, over a few sessions, over a couple hours while they're in the hospital, how to manage care of this and how to understand these alarms. And they have alarm guides. Um, so it kind of, and it tells you exactly if there's an alarm going on, it'll say call hospital contact or, or what the exact alarm is. The one thing that I do want to point out the most important to me thing on this is the, the little green arrows at the top there that kind of tells you the pump's running. I always call it the green circle of life. It kind of gives us an idea that we know the pump is on and it is running and I always tell the patients to look at that. Um, in addition to knowing that the pump's running in the event that you wouldn't see that green arrow or you were is the pump on or running, if you auscultate, if anybody's had an opportunity, if you've auscultated on these patients chest, um, it's a very distinct VAD hum that you hear. The HeartMate 2 is a very monotone hum, whereas the HeartMate 3 is a little more harmonious, but it is definitely a hum and there you do not typically hear any heart sounds in these patients. So you can go next. So just key points on equipment with these patients um, that I always like to tell people, I tell people in the hospital, I like to tell anybody in the outside world that may come in contact with these patients, that you may not know they have an LVAD. They, they're so um, creative with how they put their equipment. They have shirts that they tuck their batteries in and their controller in, and they have, you know, put a button down shirt over top of it or a blouse over top of it. So they may walk into a clinic or to Walmart or to a hospital, and you may not know. So I always tell people to be mindful of that. My patients, you know, if they're awake and conscious and alert or their caregiver is, they're, they're good about telling you the patient has an LVAD. Um, but I like people to be mindful of the equipment because if we start tugging on drive lines or tugging on controllers or their equipment, we can cause, you know, harm to the driveline exit site um, and cause some problems for them. 
I like to always make sure that they have their backup equipment with them at all times. Um, if these patients, you know, show up anywhere, they should always have the backup batteries, backup controller um, in the event they, they need to be transferred here. <clears throat> I always tell them if they call 911 or they go to the outside facility hospital, make sure everything comes with you. And the the patient and caregiver, they're very well trained on this. They're such a huge resource. I always tell, um, I tell the patients this, you know, make sure that I make them go to their, I do some education in the communities that I place these patients in, but I also tell them, I want you to go to your local fire department, your local EMS and your local emergency room. I want you to go to your PCP's office. You know, once you're feeling better after initial implant, I want you to I want you to show off your stuff, show them what you have, let them know who you are and, you know, that, you know, that stuff. I also, you know, contact the local um, EMS. So in the event that these patients have to call 911 just to get them back up to me. All right, we can go next. So we'll get into a little bit of the hemodynamics with the NOVAD and kind of how it works. So the native heart is intact. It is a left ventricular assist device and it flows over the cardiac cycle. It is continuous flow. There's axial flow and centrifugal. These patients don't have palpable pulses. A one in three percent will have a palpable pulse, and, and that's for patients that maybe are still pulsatile, that maybe have some room to go up on speed, but for whatever reason we can't. Um, but knowing when you see these patients or you run into them, they won't have a palpable pulse. Um, some patients, if they're feeling well and they're kind of funny, they'll kind of let people palpate a pulse on them and not tell them that they don't have one. I've had my patients do that. I tell them it's not a funny joke to providers, but um, but do rem remember that piece, and I always kind of hit you know talk to my emergency response people about that as well as if they find these patients especially if they find them down um, these these devices are very afterload sensitive so if these patients are, when I showed you the pump it the outflow graph ties into the ascending aorta and I told you it is a fixed speed we set that speed so the pump runs at this set set speed and it's putting oxygenated blood into the ascending aorta. And if the patient has a high afterload or they're hypertensive, it's gonna cause that pump still running at that set speed. It doesn't have the ability to overcome that. So what happens is you end up with a retrograde flow, reduced LVAD flow, and reduced cardiac output. So as these patients continue or hypertensive over a period of time, you will see them start to show signs and symptoms of heart failure because they're not getting the full um, they're not getting the full flow or the full benefits of the LVAD. And what you see too with the retrograde flow in these patients is, I'm sorry, with the retrograde flow, retrograde flow, stagnant blood, these patients have the potential to clot. The HeartMate 2 LVAD is one of the LVADs that was prone to pump thrombosis. So we really try to manage these patients' um, hypertension. In addition, they're preload dependent. So they have to have volume. The right ventricle has to be working well enough to get blood from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. Because the left ventricle, the pump is just pulling blood at the set speed out of the left ventricle, pulling volume. If the right ventricle can't keep up and get blood over there or the patient's hypovolemic, you're, it's gonna result in some suction conditions. So basically what happens is as the LVAD is pulling blood out of the left ventricle. There's not volume getting from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. It's going to continue to go at that set speed, and you're going to have what we what we call a suction event, where the ventricle just collapses on itself. Now, I said earlier there are some alarms in place um, that can tell that can sense that, and if they sense a change with that PI, that pulsatility index that we talked about, if they sense a change in the intrathoracic pressure, um, the pump will drop to this low speed, preset low speed limit um, to allow the ventricle to kind of refill. But as we see this over time, um, as we interrogate the device and we see that it's constantly sucking down on itself, we have to further evaluate. Is the patient dry? You know, is the right ventricle failing? Like what's going on? And over time, if the, if the ventricle is left ventricle is truly sucking down on itself, eventually the right ventricle is going to fail. That septum is going to keep shifting and the right ventricle is going to fail. And like I said earlier, there's no durable implantable right, FDA approved right ventricular assist device. There are some centers that are placing them. Um, but typically when these patients do go into right ventricular failure after LVAD um, implant, we're looking at temporary support, which means they're hospitalized in the ICU for weeks to months. We're looking at home inotropes, debutamine. Um, I do have a patient that did have right ventricular um, failure. He ended up on, you know, temporary RVAD support. He's home on de home debutamine. So it, it does get pretty ugly when the right ventricle starts to fail. So real important that, you know, we manage the preload and afterload of these patients. The, the heart, failing heart's still in the body, so we still have to treat the heart failure even after the LVAD's implanted. We like them to be normotensive and we like them to be urovolemic. Um, we can go ahead and go uh, next. 
So blood pressure management, uh, just it's difficult. I told you this is a continual flow device. So these patients don't have palpable pulses. So putting a automatic cuff on a patient's not going to work or yield um, an accurate blood pressure. So what we do is we do a Doppler pressure with these patients. So basically manual cuff on the arm, a Doppler, some ultrasound jelly. And we Doppler in the brachial area and you'll hear like a whoosh sound. And it's a very faint whoosh sound that you will hear when you kind of Doppler the sound from the LVAD because it is like a continual flow. And you will pump the cuff up. I tell the, the, the clinic staff and you know the, the nursing unit staff, pump the cuff up to about 100, 120 millimeters of mercury. If you think they're hypertensive, go a little bit higher and slowly release. The first time you hear that whoosh sound return your, or your return to flow sound, that's your Doppler pressure. So basically when we chart these, we say it's 80, Doppler pressure of 80. That's a great Doppler pressure. And what to think to correlate to what that number really means is that number should correlate to a mean arterial pressure. So if the patients, and we see it with our, our ICU patients as they have an art line, you know, they have an invasive art line in and we're getting a Doppler pressure, the Doppler pressure is 80. When we look up at the art line, the mean arterial pressure of the art line should be around 80, 78, 82, 80. And then we know that is a correlation. Um, so that's how we treat those numbers. Um, we like to see that number between 70 and 85. That's kind of where we let our patients live. Uh, less than 70, these patients do experience signs and symptoms of hypotension. They will tell me, I feel dizzy, I feel lightheaded. They don't feel well when their blood pressure is less than 70. Anything less than 60, we're like, what's going on? Is this patient infected? Is it low volume? We do get concerned. Or did we get a little excited with adding some antihypertensives back, you know, back to their regimen? And then greater than 85 with that increased afterload, we do not like that. Um, they don't get, they're not getting the benefits of the LVAD. And um, it is, you know, we do when they start to get greater than 85, we will start adding their heart failure medications back to them. We'll start adding back, you know, medications they couldn't tolerate pre-LVAD. These are patients that, you know, couldn't tolerate the entrestos, couldn't tolerate beta blockers, and we'll start adding these medications back to them. We can go next. So just to kind of really touch base on... Um, on management of blood pressure. This is the most important thing to us. When a patient presents anywhere, you know, just like the patient that comes into the ER and says, I have chest pain, the first thing we do is get an EKG. When the VAD patient shows up anywhere, the first thing we want is a Doppler pressure. Um, that gives us a lot of information on what's going on with the patient. So we target their pressure 70 to, it says 80 there, I would say 85. We don't want that really to exceed 85. Um, knowing that hypertension can decrease forward flow and it decreases power. And if we can manage that hypertension, we can optimize cardiac support and we reduce their stroke risk. If these patients' true Doppler pressure, true mean arterial pressure is greater than 90, they're at a 30% increased likelihood of a stroke at that given moment. So, and that's one of the, we'll get into adverse events, but stroke is an adverse event of LVAD. So we really wanna manage that hypertension to make sure they're getting the full benefit of the LVAD as well as decreasing the risk of stroke. Another thing on the management of these patients, knowing that these patients are on anticoagulation, all LVADs, they're on warfarin, they're on aspirin. You always see that more than likely there might be a time where we hold aspirin here and there, but they're always on some form of anticoagulation to prevent pump thrombosis. Um, and then sometimes you see these patients also on Persantine, um, Plavix, or Berlinta, another antiplatelet agent. So, you know, we try to go INR on these patients, two to three is kind of our goal INR, and we manage the INR in our VAD clinic. We have um, a VAD anticoagulation team that manages those INRs on those patients specifically. One thing that we tell people, don't reverse these patients. It could clot the pump. That's, you know, reversing these patients is not something we would we would rarely do. The only time we would reverse a VAD patient if it was they were having a life-threatening uh, bleed. Uh, and then with these patients and blood products, we try uh, to avoid blood products if we can. I mean, you can't always, but we're, we really try to avoid that because it introduces new um, antibodies into the bloodstream. It affects their PRA percent. And if these patients are BTT or bridge to transplant patients, it can affect their chances to get a donor heart. So this is something when it talks about managing these patients and managing, you know, reversing these patients, blood products in these patients, you know, medications in these patients. We always like everybody to just communicate with the LVAD team. Um, I have a slide on here that gives you all our contact information and how to get a hold of us. 24-7, uh, you can get a hold of anybody on our team, uh, typically me and my pager number. Um, I'll give anybody my cell phone if you come in contact with these patients and need to get them up to us. Uh, we can go next. And this will be the last slide, and then uh, the, the next time we'll start into part two. 
So arrhythmia management in these patients. So when you put these patients on EKG, you should see whatever rhythm they're in, you should see it. Um, there is, there has been some talks of with the HeartMate 3L VADs, lead placement could give you some artifact. But in terms of hooking these patients up to an EKG or get, a, a, you know, hooking them up to a monitor or getting an EKG, the rhythm you see is the rhythm you, you have. And, and knowing sometimes with these patients, they can tolerate you know, lethal arrhythmias that a normal patient couldn't tolerate or an arrhythmia that they couldn't tolerate, you know, pre-LVAD because they are being assist, you know, they do have an assist device. So knowing you could see V-fib and they're awake. So just be mindful of that. But it's okay to give them amiodine, lidocaine, cardioverter, defibrillate. You can do that. It's not going to interrupt the pump at all. So, you know, and we do want you to do that. If, these, if you find these patients and they are in, you know, a lethal arrhythmia, they, we do want them, you know, we cardiovert them, defibrillate them if you have to, because as that ventricle's quivering, what will happen is, you know, the risk of thrombus. And then in terms of CPR, a little bit different um, with these patients. If the pump's running, you have that, the green arrows, the green circle of life there, and you auscultate and hear that bad hum, we do not um, condone CPR. That pump is going to run and push all of the life-saving medications we're giving them um, to the body that we don't need to do chest compressions. There is the the notion, you know, around the VAG community that chest compressions could um, dislodge one of the cannulas, and that's still kind of being debated and talked about, and it's center to center specific to how people do things. We're kind of no CPR if the pump's running. If the pump's not running, we will do CPR, um, but we're starting to see changes. I hear some centers are talking about um, modified compressions. I'm not really sure how that exactly works, but, you know, our theory is if the pump's on and running, it's going to push the life-saving medications in the event of a, you know, a, an ACLS situation with these patients. But in the event of a true emergency, you come across one of these patients, please call us. Please call the VAD team. Um, there's my pager number. Uh, I could also, oh, I don't I'll share my cell phone too. I think everybody has it in case my patients, uh, my patients have it on their little bags too, wherever they are. Um, just in the event, we would need to, you know, help manage these patients or get them to our center. So I'll go ahead and stop there with part one. And if we have questions, you guys can ask questions or if there's other things that I should, you know, you want me to touch on for part two, I can add to that as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Monica. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys, you're all on mute, but you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask some questions. We have plenty of time. Has anybody ever had an LVAD patient come through their clinic or facility? No. I do get, um, of course I have said I have seven patients, but we do get a lot of patients from um, outside facilities that show up at our ER a lot. So I get some um, Cleveland Clinic VAD patients, some AGH VAD patients that are gonna show up here. I think they said, you know, they know we have a VAD center, but I know Char if anybody's from the Charleston area, I know I have, there's several, not, I don't have any patients down there, but Cleveland as well as um, AGH has some VAD patients in the Charleston and I think Elkins area. Um, so I don't know. That's just from talking to patients and talking to other VAD coordinators. Monica, how new is this? Like, is there, like, it doesn't seem to be a super common thing? No. So, so we started, our program started in December of 2017. We actually implanted our first patient in December of 2017. The goal was with that first year that we would implant 12 patients was our goal. Um, we only implanted seven that first year, and we're working up a couple patients right now to hopefully get to patient, you know, eight, nine, and ten. Um, but, and it's not, it's not very, not new to the state of West Virginia. I mean, it is new to the state of West Virginia and there's a limited, um, there's a limited knowledge base with LVAD just because we're the first implanting center in the state. And even, you know, a lot of the, you know, patients and other providers are just un unaware of these services that are offered. And a lot of times too, just with, you know, the challenges that we're facing in our program is just, 
the patients in the state of West Virginia, you know, there is limited access to care to these patients. And a lot of times by the time these patients show up somewhere, they're so, they're so far, they're so sick at that point that they're not even a candidate for any type of advanced therapies. You know, they'll come in because they're feeling so crummy. And by the time they make it to their primary care doctor or, or make it to us even, I mean, they're in full blown cardiogenic shock and it's like they're in an organ failure. So it's like, wow, you know, it's tough because at that point there's not a whole lot we can do for those patients. Right, absolutely. We do keep, we have a, our, our VAD team, which I should say this too, it's a pretty big team. Uh, we're comprised of three advanced heart failure physicians. We have a implanting uh, surgeon. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we keep palliative, palliative care. Um, palliative care sees all our patients just to talk about, you know, those, those tough end of life decisions and in the event that these patients would have a disabling stroke. Um, we have a uh, specialty pharmacist on our team to help with <clears throat> medication management as well as INR management. We have social work and a dietitian, And our team's small compared to our transplant team. We're about, a, I don't know, half, a quarter to half the size of the transplant team. So we are a large multidisciplinary team, which I think helps, you know, um, with patient selection and managing care of these patients because we all have a variety of backgrounds. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an RN and we have, you know, pharmacists, physicians, nurse practitioners, just in everybody in their own specialty, which makes it kind of, you know, unique to, I think, to the process. Monica? Yes. Can you hear me? This is Trisha Petit. I can. I, okay. I spoke with you on the phone a couple weeks ago. Oh, so, how are you? Uh, very good. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thanks. And I just had a couple questions for you and a comment. Um, so, are all of your seven LVAD patients, are they all full, full code status? So of the seven we've implanted, unfortunately, one patient has passed away. There were some issues with some non-compliance. Um, of the six that are that I still manage care of, they are all full code status. Um, when they um, come to our hospital, the staff, they only come to certain units in our hospital. They, the ER is trained, the cath lab and cardiac uh, CVORs are trained the cardiac ICU and the cardiac step down. So those are the only places in our hospital we allow these patients to kind of hang out or be um, as inpatients. Now, if they go up to cl different clinic patients, different um, clinics within our hospital, um, they will, you know, these patients have been, uh, the registration specialists and different people have been given like an LVAD awareness CBL that kind of says, you know, arrhythmia management, this is an LVAD, who to contact is like an eight or 10 slide CBL that we do in the institution to kind of give awareness to registration specialists in different areas of the hospital. But yes, they are full code status with the, with knowing that chest compressions are. Right. All right. Um, and then have you had infections among these LVAD patients? Yes, um, I have actually. Mm -hmm. I have a patient that we're managing, um, co-managing with infectious disease and OPAD at home that has bacter was bacteremic. We can't find the source of the bacteremia. Typically, when these patients get infected, you know, and he's at this point over a year out of implant. So when they get a, you know, an infection, your first source is the drive line. They have a drive line that exits one side of the abdomen or the other. It's connected to the pump. That's typically going to be your source of infection. However, they ruled out that that was the source of infection. So we don't know the source, but he is bacteremic and there's infection in the pump um, as well, the pump pocket as well as in the pump. And the unfortunate part of that is, you know, you take the, the what you need to do is take the hardware out. So it needs to come out so the infection can heal. However, he would need temporarily supported and there's not a, you know, would that still get infected? So he really would, the treatment here would be a transplant. However, due to a relapse in smoking, he's not a transplant candidate at this time. Oh, I see. It's very unfortunate, but he's doing, he's doing well. We're a couple of months with this infection and, and he's doing okay, but it's, it's, he's starting to get a little cachexic and you can see the inflammatory process taking its toll on him. Do you treat them with antibiotics at that point? That's yeah, what he's, he's on? Yeah, he's on IV antibiotics right now. Um, infectious disease is helping us, you know, manage that. And then he'll go on lifelong suppressive antibiotic therapy. I see. Cool. Okay. Very good. Um, the comment that I had to make was that I was speaking with an uh, ER nurse a couple weeks ago um, out of Reading, PA, and she was saying that they will have LVAD patients come through their ER and they'll need... Uh, 
replacement batteries. They don't have batteries and they'll end up giving them the batteries and then they're transported out because they don't treat LDAD yeah. patients there. Yeah. And so then they lose their batteries and apparently the batteries are quite costly. Yes. Very expensive. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. That's why I'm always like, well, my patients bring your backup equipment with you because they have to have that backup equipment. And in the event they show up without it, mm -hmm. I got to go crack open brand new backup equipment for them to have. So right. I'm always like, bring it with you so we can travel. And we've had, there's been times that RER has made patient family members go home to get this backup equipment for patients. And we've had patients show up that, you know, if a Cleveland patient or an Allegheny or an outside facility VAD center patient shows up in my ER, I, we, if we treat and release, we can, we do it in conjunction with the implanting facility. But if the patient needs admitted, typically we fly them to Cleveland or we fly them to Allegheny, wherever their right. implanting center is, we usually get them there. So if they backup. show up backup equipment, and I'm like, well, you're flying to Cleveland, you need backup batteries. So I would run into that, in, that instance where I might have to give them some backup batteries. The batteries. So are most um, emergency rooms, uh, are they, do they have backup batteries for the most part or not? In West Virginia, no. No, they do no, not. They show up and, they show up and uh, if they walk into the emergency room, my, my patients are pretty well trained and educated on the fact that they don't just show up at an emergency room like they call me first. And typically, and I talk, like I said, I've, I've educated the EMS in the area that I've placed these patients. So if they have to go pick them up, the goal is to get them to me. And they'll do that. I'll say, hey, this patient XYZ is going on. I'll call and talk to the EMS. And I was like, can you just drive them straight to me? And they will. They'll bypass three hospitals to get them to me. Okay. Um, and those other hospitals don't want them. They're like, ah, you oh, know. Oh, yeah, no, they don't know how to treat them. Yeah, they don't. And then, you know, so when they were bringing the one patient to me, I said, listen, if she's unstable, they might have to stop at UHC. So let me know so I can, like, prepare them for what's going to happen if the patient's up there. If I, I mean, I could run down there. I'm not that far. But, you know, typically Health Net gets them right to us. So the goal is to get them, you know. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. All right, awesome. Were there any other questions, comments, or anything you guys want to bring up here at the Heart Failure Echo? No? Right. Monica, thank you so much. We thank look you. forward to the next part of this. All right, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So our next one will be in two weeks, um, the 17th. I'll send out the reminder emails about that. Um, we would like to start getting cases. We've been running this about two months now. That's a pretty good time for people to start at least sending in questions or something. Um, so I will be reaching out to some people. I think too, we'll probably try to have some case studies to show more, like the simple side. Like um, I was talking with somebody and it's like what to look out for when you think they should start cardiac help. So. I will be in touch with everybody about that. And everybody have a great day. All right, thank you. Thank you.